You are welcome to this brief preview of the Epistle to the Ephesians, Chapter 3, from the New English Translation of 2019, noting 5th century or earlier manuscript variants. We're following an arbitrary working outline of the Epistle to the Ephesians, consisting of these nine sections. We are currently working through section four on teaching and edification. The structure of this passage begins with a reason to pray based upon New Testament revelation, and then a long parenthesis explaining the origin and purpose of Paul's gospel. This includes a message for Gentiles a message for angels about God's eternal purpose, and then a request, followed by the intercessory prayer itself and words of worship. If you are meeting with others, have someone read aloud verses 1 through 3. Then allow participants to share their observations, comments, and questions before you share your own then you might ask, for what reason? This relates back to chapter 2. Then observe that the main clause or sentence starts at verse 14. Some will want to ask, who could or can get a revelation from God? And if so, is every revelation a flawless word from God? More about this passage before Paul actually states his prayer in verse 14, he presents a long digression. This was a common literary device in ancient writings. Here, verses 1 through 13 provide reasons for the prayer that starts in verse 14. He calls himself a prisoner, and in fact, he was in prison in Caesarea. In ancient times, and in some communities to this day, Followers of an imprisoned leader become suspect of sedition or rebellion against the state. When he calls himself a steward, he uses a common term for a household manager who was often a slave or a freedman with great responsibility and with prestige in a wealthy home. His phrase, if indeed, is intended to provoke careful thought. He speaks about a mystery. In the Bible, a mystery is not something still hidden, but rather a hidden truth that God is now making known, as in Daniel 2.19. Have someone read aloud verses 4 and 5, and let all make their observations. Define this mystery from the passage itself and then ask, why say revealed as it has been now revealed, that is, the manner, instead of but, but has now been revealed, as though it were something opposite, a contrast. You may choose to point out that the phrase his apostles and prophets in the Greek makes this a unique class of individuals who work together. Some will want to know who could or can get a revelation from God. Well, certainly these. First Testament speaking prophets, First Testament writing prophets, first century individuals named in Scripture, Messiah Jesus himself, the New Testament apostles appointed by Jesus, and then New Testament prophets. And of course, we receive the revelation, which is the New Testament scriptures. Everything else that men proclaim or pretend to be a revelation may prove more or less true to revealed scripture, which remains the standard of truth to this day. Have someone read aloud verses 6 and 7. And Gentiles are fellows with whom else? 
what do God's grace and power enable us to become? Rich? Successful? Powerful? Respected? And who exercised God's power in a way to get his gift? Have someone read aloud verses 8 and 9. After others have made their observations, you may wish to ask, what made Paul least amongst the saints? Referencing 1 Corinthians 15, 9. And then, what did the First Testament prophets not know about future salvation for Gentiles? When he says God has created all things, ask all which things? What is he referring to? Now, here are some of the riches that we have received from Messiah from chapter 1 and elsewhere. In the past, we were born again, delivered from Satan, and made holy to God. In the present time, we know the truth about Jesus. We have access to the Father, and we bear the fruit and exercise gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the future, we are awaiting resurrection from the dead, rewards for all obedience to the Lord Jesus, and to take part in ruling over nations. Have someone read verse 10 aloud. Who are these rulers and authorities? And what do spirit rulers learn from Gentiles being in the church? Compare 1 Corinthians 2, 8. And then, what is to become of the spirits that rule over Gentile nations? Certainly, they will be displaced and replaced by us who follow Jesus. Here are, some of, here are several of the New Testament terms used for political spirits. They are rulers, principalities, authorities, powers, lords or dominions, thrones, and world leaders, the cosmocrats. We understand that godless national leaders around the world unwittingly follow the dictates of unseen spirits. Have someone read aloud verses 11 and 12. After they have made their observations, ask, what purpose? Compare Ephesians 1.10. And then, what shall we do with access to God? We Christians, if we can go straight to God about any matter, what should we ask? Note that the phrase reads literally, through the faith of him. Now, does this mean our faith in Jesus or our loyalty to Jesus? Or is this a reference to Jesus' faithfulness to God? Read aloud verse 13. What was it that Paul was suffering while a prisoner at Caesarea? How was that of benefit to others? Think about his standing faithful for the gospel to the Gentiles. And in what sense was it for our glory? Now, you may wish to observe, had Paul not suffered to defend his mission to the Gentiles, then many would not have become destined for glory, that is, everlasting life. And now, here is the prayer. Have someone read aloud verses 14 through 16. After they make their observations, you may choose to ask, what does it mean to name every family. In the Bible, when someone names a place, a thing, or a community, what does that tell us about the namer? And in heaven and on earth, are there families, clans, and tribes in heaven as there are on earth? And how are we changed when strengthened with power through his Spirit in our inner person. What difference does this make to how we think and feel and act towards ourselves, 
towards other believers and in the wider community. To be strengthened with power in our inner person was also known under the First Testament. Exodus 15.2 reads, The Lord is my strength and my might, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. Some Bible translations in place of might have the word song. Some Hebrew manuscripts, including the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Latin Vulgate translation, supply the pronoun my. And this term translated either might or song, zimra, is actually two words, homonyms pronounced alike. One of them means a melody, and the other means strength. Other passages in the Hebrew Bible where this term occurs with the pronoun my refer to strength, as in Isaiah 12 and Psalm 118. Scholars who study ancient manuscripts have conjectured that the original word my, which is simply a small yod suffix followed by the initial yod on the yaw, that is, the Lord, was lost during copying some centuries ago. More about Paul's prayer. Read verses 17. Have someone read aloud verses 17 through 19. Note that the Greek term for dwell is katoikeo, which means to settle down and stay. You may wish to discuss whether the phrase the love of Christ refers to our love for Christ or his love for us, or a Christ-like love. What fits best in the context? And then, what is the ultimate Christian experience? Find your answer in these verses. And lastly, verses 20 and 21. When will God start applying his power? Oh, he's already started. And what more could we ask? What more could we think? Do we have so little because we've neither asked nor thought about what God might want to do in us, amongst us, through us? In what sense will the church become the new divine council, the holy ones who surround the throne of God? Now, the term used here for generations, according to the dictionary, can mean a race or kind it can mean a generation in the sense of contemporaries, or it could mean an age group, or fourthly, a family history. Which meaning best fits this context? In brief, then, a note about the divine council. This biblical truth is referenced in Deuteronomy. The whole heavenly creation, you must not be seduced to worship and serve them for the Lord, your God, has assigned them to all the nations of the world. What does that mean? Deuteronomy 32, 8, The Most High gave the nations their inheritance according to the number of the heavenly assembly. And then Psalm 82, 1, God stands in the assembly of El, a name of God, in the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. If you have time, ask everyone to share one truth, insight, belief, or action that they have learned from this passage this week. Before next time, let us read a chapter of Ephesians each day in versions that you trust, and then let us study Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, preparing our comments and queries to bring to our next study session.